Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Brett Augustine. I'm a recovery business advisor for North Central Texas Small Business Development Centers. We are a leading provider of assistance for small businesses, and we're grant funded, which allows us to offer these services at no cost to you. Managing cash flow during periods of uncertainty with uh, Angela Randolph is one of the things that we talked about recently with her, and we're happy to have her back today with the importance of tracking your finances and measuring performance. For those of you that don't know Angela, I'm going to ask her to give her a brief uh, introduction to herself, and you're going to find out just why she's so amazing with finances, and we're so happy to have you today, Angela. Thank you, Brett. I really appreciate it. Let me get my slide deck. If anybody has questions during this process, please go ahead and put them in the chat room. We'll be happy to take those as we go or at the end of this session. So just letting you know, Angel will be happy to take your questions. Please drop them in the chat box. I'll right. also put a link in there for some of the past courses and classes in case you missed some so that you can go to our YouTube channel. All right. And Angela, thank you so much for joining us, ladies and gentlemen, Miss Angela Randolph. Thank you. Can you see the slide presentation? Absolutely. Okay, great. All right. Special thanks to the North Central Texas SBDC for allowing me to present this uh, information to you guys. I really appreciate that opportunity. <clears throat> Today, we're going to be talking about, we're going to start off with some small business stats or facts. The financial statements we'll walk through, we'll talk about some accounting software apps that can help you with the tracking of your finances. We're going to talk about key performance indicators that you'll be using to measure your business uh, financial results. And then we're going to also talk about the external users who will be interested in your finances in those reports. And then we'll wrap up with a Q&A. So let's get started. A little bit about me. I'm a CPA licensed here in Texas since 1998. Gosh, that sounds like a long time ago. Um, CEO of Stella Ledgers, uh, where I provide um, outsourced CFO and controller services, consulting and financial coaching. And then I also do training workshops such as this. I have over 20 years of corporate accounting, finance, state and federal tax audits, big four public accounting experience. All right, so let's get into it. Small business facts. 20% um, of small businesses fail within the very first year. Very first year. So not bad. 80% survive, right? 50% of small businesses fail by the fifth year. Not so great. 50-50 chance of you surviving once you hit year five. And after 10 years, the survival rate drops to approximately 35% according to the US Bureau of Labor and Statistics. So one key indicator, poor financial management and decision-making is one of the strongest drivers of small business failure. And it really prevents owners from reaching that crucial five-year milestone, okay? So why do we need to know the numbers? It tells the story of how your business is doing financially. You need to know this so you can make the best decisions regarding every aspect of your operations. Um, again, you know, specific things about operations like pricing, inventory, purchases, when to hire people, when to grow, when to expand. You won't know these things without knowing the, the financial numbers, um, the results of your business. And then it'll also help you identify problem areas like cash leakages, shortages, slow paying customers or no paying customers, slow moving inventory. All of these things you'll be able to determine when you're tracking your finances. And then it also allows you to comply with state, local and federal tax laws. The IRS mandates that you do record keeping and that you keep track of your finances because you're going to need that in order to file your tax return, prepare your tax return, even if someone else prepares it on your behalf. And it makes the whole tax preparation process a lot smoother and it helps you maximize your business deductions because if you're not tracking all of your expenses, then you may be overlooking some deductions that could potentially 
reduce your tax liability, right? So the IRS is not going to help you identify what those are. And then it's required for business funding opportunities from lenders and investors. Everyone who is in the investing in lending business is going to have a vested interest in wanting your financial statements. That's standard. So let's talk about this quote. I love this quote. Accounting is the language of business. It's, it may seem like it's a whole separate language, but hopefully after we're done with this workshop, you'll get more familiar with um, some terms that you should be made aware of. Um, the goal is not to turn you into an accountant, but as a business owner, you want to zone in on some key things that you should really be paying close attention to, even if you're working with an accountant. So Warren Buffett, famous quote, accounting is the language of business. And that's what people talk about in the business world. They're really talking about the financial statements, the reports, um, when they have discussions about strategic things or um, deciding, you know, should they introduce a new product line or expand the business, they're going to look to those financial statements and those key performance indicators that we'll talk about later to determine if they should move forward with those plans. And it's how you communicate in business, basically. So we're gonna talk about for this discussion, the three key financial reports. Um, the first one will be the profit and loss statement, otherwise um, called the income statement, the balance sheet and the cash flow statement. So what is the profit and loss statement? I'll be using those terms interchangeably, profit and loss and income statement. It shows your revenue, costs, and expenses during any given period of time. It could be a month, it could be six months, it could be a quarter, it could be 12 months. It's typically used to show business lenders and investors whether a company has made or lost money during a given period. And it's like your financial health report card. Most business owners are familiar with the profit and loss statement because even if you're a sole proprietor and you're only filing a Schedule C, that Schedule C is in a sense a P&L statement for the business. You're not required to file a balance sheet. So let's take a closer look here. I have a sample income statement here and it's pretty, it has a lot. It's comprehensive. I tried to include as many uh, expense items to give you an idea of how it falls into the income statement as possible. And, and for this example, um, we have ABC company and they sell goods. And how you know that is I'm zoning in on the cost of goods sold where they're carrying inventory, right? So if you have a service-based business, you will not have cost of goods sold. You may have cost of sales or cost of labor but you won't have this inventory um, section here in the cost of goods sold. So this is a comprehensive example, okay? Everyone's gonna start off with gross sales. Everyone, hopefully, you have something in that, in that column, um, in that row. And then if you have returns and allowances, that's going to be subtracted from your gross sales, then you'll have a net sale number. And then if you have cost of goods sold, you're gonna start with your beginning inventory which is really the end in inventory of the prior period. And you're gonna add in any purchases, freight in costs, direct labor, indirect expenses. And then you're going to reduce this number by end in inventory to get your cost of goods sold number. So your net sales, less cost of goods sold will give you your gross profit. Now this is before you pay any of the bills of the business. So this is a key number, and we'll talk about this later in the presentation, a key number to really zone in on because it's important that you're bringing in enough money to buy the raw materials that you need to bring your goods to life, manufacture your goods, right? And also it's a good idea to keep track of cost of goods sold because if the price of your raw materials and your items are going up, and you haven't really accounted for that by perhaps raising your prices, then this is where you would 
this section here is where you would identify these type of issues, okay? So next we'll get into what we call below the line expenses. Um, we have things like advertising, bank charges from your business bank account, um, if you're making any charitable contributions, if you're making commissions, contract labor. It says credit card fees here, but that also is uh, considered like merchant fees if you process credit cards um, for your uh, customers. There's a fee involved in that, so you want to keep track of those costs. Delivery expenses, depreciation, dues and subscriptions, insurance that you're paying for the business, interest expense that you're incurring for any credit cards or debt that you may have, maintenance for equipment or vehicles, anything related to the business. So all of these items are business related. And how do we get here is you have to do some kind of bookkeeping on a regular consistent basis in order to come up with this income statement. That's where it all starts really by tracking the activity on that's happening in your business daily. <clears throat> So you can put things in the right category and reflect what's truly happening in your business, right? So we have things like professional fees, rent, repairs, telephone, travel. Now to think about travel, this doesn't mean like your vacation to Aruba that has nothing to do with business, right? So we wanna make sure that if it's business related travel that you wanna put this here. And also the same for utilities. We're not talking about your personal cable bill or water. You know, if you're working outside of the home, if you're working in the home, there is a home office deduction that you can use um, that will assign a pro rata percentage to your office space inside the home. So just keep in mind that these items are all business related expenses and this income statement is something that you can use to report on your Schedule C and you want to keep track of these things. And the bottom line number we have here is net income, right? That's something that everyone's going to be interested in. Did we lose money? Did we make money, right? So the grand scheme of things is we're going to start with the gross profit and we're going to take out the uh, total expenses. And then if you have other income items, so other income items would be like if you sold some assets, right? <clears throat> That's not a part of your operating activity, right? You may sell um, equipment that's obsolete or you no longer use. Or another area where this may come into, like a lot of people who've gotten their PP loans forgiven, this is where it would be reflected here. Because <clears throat> in a sense, the forgiven amount is actually income to the business. Now, one caveat with that is um, Congress made it such that it's not reportable on your tax return. So the IRS is going to um, allow you to not report PPP forgivable loans, which will be in this other income section um, due to the COVID, the pandemic, right? But if it was any other forgivable loan or any other cancellation of debt, this is where you would reflect it. You see you have interest income here as well. And so this category really represents income that's not associated with the day-to-day -day operations, okay? And then, like I said, we have the bottom line here, net income, and if it was a loss, that would be shown in parentheses. So this is your typical what a typical income statement will look like for a business that is selling goods. The only difference would be for a service-based business is that they may not have cost of sales or cost of labor at all. It may just be a revenue line, right? And so there's really no gross profit because there's no cost involved that they're tracking um, to the, come up with gross profit. So in most cases, your net sales and your gross profit are the same. Okay. So what is the balance sheet? The balance sheet shows a snapshot of the company's financial standing. It enables you to see what the business owns by way of assets and what it owes by way of liabilities. And it breaks down 
the assets and liabilities and owners equity at a specific point in time. Okay. And this helps you as a business owner determine the financial strength and ability of the business. One thing us accountants always like is a good formula, right? Assets are always equal to liabilities plus equity together. So let's see what that looks like. Here's a sample balance sheet. And these two are independent of each other, I should say. Even though it says ABC company, um, these are two different samples, okay? So we have, as part of our assets, current assets, we have cash. If you had accounts receivable balance, you would have that balance there. If you had an inventory balance, that would be there. Prepaid expenses is also considered a current asset. And where you would see that is if you're paying for, let's say an insurance policy, the whole thing up front for 12 months, right? So for that period that has not elapsed yet, that would be considered a prepaid expense. And then short-term investments, and then you have your fixed assets or long-term assets, which would include p uh, property, plant, equipment, less any uh, accumulated depreciation, intangible assets. That could be things like trademarks, goodwill, copyrights, things like that. Um, and then you have this total asset line, right? So it's important. <clears throat> Banks and lenders and other interested parties, they want to know if you have any assets in the business. Um, this is not necessarily going to be tracked at all on the P&L, so it's not required if you're a Schedule C for you to have a balance sheet, but it does help to give a full picture of your business if you had one. So I always recommend one, okay? So let's take a look at the liability section. Accounts payable. These are things that you may owe vendors, suppliers, you would capture that here. If you had any short-term loans, that's anything 12 months or less that you would capture here. Um, taxes payable, you know, um, if you have state taxes, local taxes, or if you um, are accruing your um, income taxes, you would put this here as well. Accrue salaries and wages. If you are on um, payroll yourself and have other employees, you want to capture that here. And this is all accrual base, right? So accrual base is according to GAAP. So it's not mandatory that you do it accrual base. You can also do it cash basis as well. And if so, usually with cash basis, you're not going to have these accruals. But you want to keep in mind of the people that you owe. Um, so it's always best to track it in some way. If you're not doing it through a bookkeeping software, you always want to keep track of the payments and things that you owe people. Because at some point, that cash payment is going to go out the door, and you want to be able to track that, okay? Long-term debt, other. And then the equity section is owner's investment. It can also be owner's draw as well in here. But the investment is you putting money into the business, right? A lot of small businesses are funded, self-funded. They're bootstrapping, so they have to take their personal funds and transfer it into the business. And then you may also want to take cash out of the business. If you're a sole proprietor, that's the only way to really pay yourself through an owner's draw, okay? And you retain earnings is the earnings earned in the business that haven't been distributed out, okay? And so in this let me go back. So in this example, you see that both total assets and total liabilities and owner's equity equal the same. So they balance. And if they didn't balance, something, you know something is wrong and you would need to fix it, right? So you never want to give anyone a balance sheet that doesn't balance because that's going to really stick out and people are going to not rely on it because they know that something is off, right? Okay, so next let's talk about the cash flow statement. There's three sections, and the cash flow statement is going to derive from your balance sheet, obviously, because we got cash on the balance sheet, and then it's also going to pull in things from your PL statement. Okay, so the operating section is going to capture collections from customers, cash paid to suppliers, employers, cash paid for interest 
and taxes and the revenue from dividends and interest in other other areas, right? So this is the net cash flowing in from just your operating activity, right? Everything, your day-to-day -day operating activity. So then the next section is going to be net cash flow from investing. So what is that? That's the purchase or sale of equipment. Remember on that P&L statement, we sold some equipment. And that was classified in the other income category on a P&L. So if on the balance sheet, you had equipment on there, and then that, that number from beginning to the end of the period is reduced, then that indicates that something happened to that equipment. You either sold it, wrote it off, something happened, and kind of, you know, on the, on the um, reverse end of that, if the balance increases, that means you use money or you use something on credit or whatever to invest and buy more um, assets. Now, if you use cash to do it, it's gonna show up in this investing section. Now, if you use credit, then it won't necessarily be here because this is a cash flow statement, okay? So let's talk about net cash flow from finance and activities. What does that reflect? Sales of common stock, if you are C corporation and you issue common stock to shareholders, um, the more popular activities when you're getting loans from um, institutions or banks or alternative sources and you're paying both principal and interest down, right? So when you first get that cash infusion from a lender, that's going to be reflected here. And as you pay down the loan, the cash flow from that entire activity is going to be captured here in the financing activity section. Okay, and then <clears throat> what will happen is to get the net change in cash. If it's positive, that means the business is generating enough cash for ongoing operations with some left over. If it's negative, that means more cash is needed either through the sale of loans, I mean the sale of stock or the acquisition of funding from a bank or other sources, or you have to employ some other strategies to get more cash. Um, into the business. Now, usually the cash flow statement is going to coincide with the other periods. So, whatever period that you're generating this cash flow statement is going to come from the net income statement from that same period and the balance sheet from that same period. Okay. And so, the reason, <clears throat> the way that you can check to make sure that your net change in cash ties is you're going to look at your balance sheet and see the beginning um the beginning balance for cash and the ending balance and so that should tie to this net change in cash amount right most accounting softwares and we'll go over those will um automatically generate this so this is usually not something you have to do manually unless you're tracking everything manually but if you're using a software that is generating an income statement in a balance sheet, then this cash flow is going to pull from those two statements in order to generate this. But you do want to review it and look at it and make sure that your cash will check your cash position and make sure that you are generating enough cash to um, operate the business. So what does the cash flow statement tell you? You know, are you consistently generating more cash than it spends, right? Does the business have enough cash to pay debts and other bills? Lenders are going to be very interested in that. How does your business receive money from sales and investments? How does your business spend money on operating expenses, capital investments, taxes, and interests? Like I mentioned before, it's very important to investors. They want to know the short-term viability of your company. And that cash flow statement is going to quickly tell them the answer to that question. So here's some technology options that you can use to help you track your numbers. Of course, QuickBooks is very popular. They've been around for a long time. They dominate. Um, the small business accounting software industry, Zero's up and coming competitor. It's, uh, um, I believe it's an Australian, New Zealand company that is strictly cloud based. Um, QuickBooks has both a desktop and an online version. 
Um, there's Zoho books, Fresh Books Way. There's so many. I'm sure there's even more popping up every day. Um, what I look for is something that's user friendly. You know, you want to get something that's going to be easy for you to use on a consistent basis. It'll be nice, very nice, if it's a software that will uh, integrate with your bank. Um, so if you have banking relationship with one of the majors, you shouldn't have a problem. If it's a small local bank, you might want to check before you make the software purchase to make sure that the integration is there. Now, if it's not there, there are some workarounds because um, I've encountered this from time to time with business owners who may have an account at a local credit union. Most banks will allow you to download the business activity. Okay, it's a manual process, but you know, if you've committed to the software, it, you should just do this periodically once a month, twice a month. You download the activity in a CSV. Most accounting software will allow you to import files so you can do a manually um, import into the software and from there you can do the categorizations and make sure everything is properly classified um, and you could do it that way. But most of these that I list here will connect with all the major and regional banks and so you don't have to do that manual process and so all you would have to do is come in and review the line item and put it in a proper category. QuickBooks and Xero, I don't know about the others because I'm not as familiar with the others, but if you have like recurring activity, it's the same thing every month from the same vendor, you can even put rules in place to somewhat automate the bookkeeping and tracking process. Now, you do have to review it every now and then, some of the rules will get tripped up. So, you can't like totally abandon the process. You do want to review it to make sure the rules are operating the way that they should and that they're not attaching themselves to other transactions because that does happen. So, but there are, you know, things in place that will kind of streamline the process, especially if you have a lot of volume, a lot of activity or a lot of different accounts, more than five accounts. And you want to include all your accounts, not just some of them. If you have operating a tax account, a savings account, credit cards, you, I would recommend that you connect all of those accounts to the software so that you can track everything that's happening in your business and not just some of the activity, okay? So let's talk about measuring your financial results, KPIs or key performance indicators. So tracking the data is the first step, right? You wanna track the data and you wanna go back and look at it. You wanna to look to see if you're moving closer to your goal, if you met your goal, or if you're nowhere near the goal. Sometimes it could be not so pleasant experience if you know that things are not going well, but if you're in business and you want to stay in business, you have to find the courage to look at those numbers because when you see it on paper, when you see it in black and white, that really solidifies, it should, that, you know, we need to take some kind of action. We need to put a plan together if things are not going well. But if we just ignore it or if we never look at it, then it's easy for us to just pretend like the problem is not there. And we don't want to do that. Okay, so these key performance indicators, they're quantifiable tools, you know, for, for performance measurement. We don't have to guess, we don't have to think, we don't have to feel, you know, <laughs> these are quantifiable, right? And it's going to really help you define and evaluate your progress towards your goal. That's the only way to do it. And it's not just small businesses, large businesses are doing it. Everyone, everyone, this is the measuring process, these K, these KPIs that every business uses, okay? So you may be asking, which one should I focus on? There are different sets of metrics that are important to different businesses. You know, when you're thinking about KPIs, you have to consider what your long and short-term goals are, the size and location of your business, 
where you are in the life cycle. If you're a startup, you're in the growth phase, or you're more on the mature side of the business. And then the field or industry you're in is going to have um, an impact in any unique circumstances that you have. In case in point about a unique circumstance, it's this whole pandemic, right? So when you're looking at your results, you have to keep in mind that we're two years into a pandemic. So you may not want to really, you can compare it to 2019, but don't beat yourself up about it because 2019 was a different set of circumstances. We didn't have a global pandemic, a supply chain, global issue. So you have to keep all these things in mind and be able to pivot and shift where you can in order to improve those things. So I don't want you to really use this measuring process as a downer. Sometimes it can be if you're not where you want to be, but use it as a tool to jumpstart your plan to turn things around or come up with creative ideas to maybe introduce new services or goods that can help turn things around, okay? So, because I'm in finance, I wanna focus on the financial KPIs, but there are all kinds of KPIs. There's, there's so many, um, there's marketing KPIs, sales KPIs, customer service KPIs, you know, anything in your business you can measure, okay? But because we're in finances, we're gonna focus on some, these are not all, these are some financial KPIs that I'm going to talk about today. We have revenue, the current ratio, cost of goods sold, the gross profit margin, the net profit, net profit margin, aging accounts receivable, and total inventory. All right, revenue, otherwise what us accountants call the top line, okay? That's where it all starts, money coming into the door. This is the income your business has earned from the sale of your goods and services. Now, this should be an easy one to track because I think everyone understands what revenue is or sales income is, you know. So revenue is an important KPI to measure over a period of time. So you want to compare it to month over month, quarter over quarter, year over year. What's happening? Are we increasing our revenue? Or is revenue declining? And if it's consistently declining, that could be a warning sign of trouble, right? And as I remember, as I said before, you want to keep in mind the circumstances of what's happening. If revenue is declining for everybody in your industry, then it could be some things that are outside of your control, okay? So keep that in mind. You want to think about not just your business, but also think about benchmarking it against others in your same industry, all right? Current ratio, what is that? It measures your liquidity or your ability to pay the bills of the business. So it's your total current assets. If you remember the balance sheet example, total current assets divided by your total current liabilities, right? So the current assets was things like your receivables, your short-term investments, your cash. And remember the current liabilities were things like your short-term debt, accounts payable, okay? So the higher the ratio, the better generally a ratio of two or more indicates good short-term financial strength. You want to um, really pay close attention to this because if you're having issues paying your bills, then you're going to find it right here in this current ratio, okay? Cost of goods sold for those that are selling goods, um, manufacturing things, you want to pay attention to this as a good metric. Um, we went through this on the balance sheet, beginning inventory plus purchases, less ending inventory. That's pretty much the definition of cost of goods sold. It's going to measure your direct costs incurred in producing products that were sold during a specific period, right? Um, it's the amount of money that you spend on labor, materials, overhead to manufacture or purchase products that were sold to customers during the year. Gross profit is determined what cost of goods sold and it's impacted by your pricing strategy. Remember what I said, 
if you're finding that your costs, the prices of the things that you're purchasing to sell to your customers increasing, if you don't adjust your pricing, then you're going to see it in this gross profit. You're going to see it in your gross profit. It's going to be declining because you have one factor that's going up and your prices will either remain the same or God forbid they get lower because we don't want that. That's going to make the gross profit even worse. So you want to keep your costs of uh, goods that you're selling to customers. You want to keep on top of that. Okay. And right now we're going through an inflation period right now. So it's really, really important. Gross profit margin. So we just talked about that. It's revenue less the cost of goods sold divided by revenue. So it's going to be a percentage, right? It's going to measure the proportion of the revenue you have left over after deducting all costs related to sales. And it should be large enough to cover your fixed operating expenses, right? Because we haven't even paid the bills of the business. We haven't paid rent. We haven't paid, you know, professional fees and maintenance. We still have all these other things that are expenses that we have yet to pay for the business. So if your gross mar profit margin is declining, then that is going to be an issue. Um, and it could result in a net loss, right? It could result in a net loss if your gross profit margin is declining but your bills, your expenses, your operating expenses are remaining the same or getting higher, okay? So you wanna target the percentage based on the type of business that you have. Um, so I would recommend doing some industry research to see what is a good gross profit margin, right? You definitely wanna make sure you have enough to pay and cover your operating expenses, but in terms of benchmarking and setting goals for your business, find out what that percentage is, you know, so you can aim towards that in your business and in your industry. So net profit, net profit, that bottom line number that we, sh we showed on the income statement is total revenue minus total expenses, okay? We call that the bottom line. That's the amount left over after you've paid all the bills, okay? And I have an example here. If your sales last year totaled $100,000, your business expenses for rent, inventory, salaries, etc., added up to $80,000, then your net profit is $20,000, okay? So let's talk about the net profit margin. So this is shown as a, a percentage, okay? It's going to be your net profit divided by that total revenue line. Okay, it tells you what percentage of your revenue was actually profit, okay? It measures the proportion of revenue left after all the expenses have been paid. So that's important. You definitely want to, there's going to be many people looking at that, right? I could tell you one person, one agency that's going to be really, really interested in your net profit, and that's the IRS, right? Because they can't tax you on a net loss. So they want you to make a profit, as much profit as you can. <laughs> so they can tax you on it. So, but definitely you you want to make as much profit as possible as well. I mean, you can invest that money back into their business. You can do so much, okay? Aging accounts receivable, all right? So if your customers do not pay you up front, then you should have an accounts receivable. If your goods and services, you're allowing people to pay 30 days later, two weeks later, whatever the terms are, you want to be sure that this doesn't get too far out for a number of reasons, okay? Um, you want to make sure that people pay by the due date. If they pay early, that's even better, you know? But you definitely want, if you um, are invoicing your customers, hopefully that invoicing system should come with a, an accounts receivable aging report. And you want to look at this at least once a month to be sure that you, you know, those auto reminders are going out, that people are aware that they still have a balance with you so they can, you know, pay what's owed, especially if they've already, if the goods have already been delivered. If the goods have already been delivered, they may not have such a crazy incentive to pay if you're not asking for it. So you definitely want to ask for the money 
preferably up front before you make that final deliverable, but depending on how your business is set up and your relationship with the customer um, or what's best practice in your industry, um, you want to tailor it to that. But in any case, if people owe money to you, it's important that you collect that money, okay? And so this aging report is going to identify who the customers are, what outstanding balances have yet to be collected, and it'll be usually there's a 30-day, 60-day, 90-day, 120-day bucket, okay? Preferably, I don't like to see any customers in the 60 day book, unless there's some specialized arrangement for that. If you're doing progress billing or if you're doing um, a percentage of completion or something like that, then that may be acceptable for those type of arrangements. Okay. But if you're just in, you know, you've already delivered the goods, there's really no reason why someone should still be owing you money 60 days, 90 days out. So this is a an important KPI you want to keep track of. And it may be uncomfortable, but asking people for money, you're in business, you're going to have to get comfortable with it, right? Because that's the only way that you can pay the bills of the business. You can keep the business afloat. You need that cash flow for your business, right? You're trying to survive. You're trying to thrive. So, you know, like I mentioned in another workshop, you know, instituting a late fee can incentivize people to pay by the due date, having those auto reminders go out. Um, it could be that the person just simply forgot, you know, and um, so we definitely want to keep track of this report. Total inventory. These are for businesses that have inventory. You want to track it on a regular basis so you can spot problems early enough to avoid, you know, the negative effects of excess inventory, okay? And that could include storage costs, reduced profits, and potential waste. Now, what you may be experiencing due to the pandemic is um, not enough inventory, right? Because of the supply chain issue. So that's something you, you also want to keep um, on top of it as well, because you don't want to maybe advertise that you have something to sell and you get the money and then you can't deliver. That could be a potential hit to your reputation as a business. You know, the customer could be disappointed that they're not able to get, you know, what they paid for, especially if they pay for it up front and you've not been able to get it in inventory. So you want to really keep on top of both spectrums. You know, um, you don't want to be carrying around too much inventory and you want to really track if you don't have enough inventory you know, how is that going to impact your business? You know, is it a industry-wide problem or is it just something with you and your supplier, the one supplier that you may be dealing with? Or is it a global supply chain issue, right? Because if it's that, then you may be limited in what you can do. And then the customer, they may try to go to the competitor, but your competitor is going to have the same issue, right? I can give you one example that I experienced personally <laughs> is the furniture, trying to buy furniture during the pandemic, right? Awful, awful months and months and months and months for something that would have been in like within two weeks, but because it was stuck on a ship somewhere overseas, there was nothing that the furniture store could do, but just keep apologizing basically. Um, so in that case, even if I went to another furniture store, they were having the same problem due to the pandemic, okay? And so also in cases of high anticipated demand, you wanna keep you know that in mind as well. When you have planned increases in inventory, you may wanna ramp up in the event of promotions or holiday sales. And then you also may want to pivot if there's a, you know, shortage in areas. You don't want to keep advertising for something that you know is not going to be around for your customers to purchase, okay? So next, let's talk about the external stakeholders or your financial statements. I've alluded to a few um, already throughout the presentation, but these could be individuals 
or institutions who are not a part of your organization, but they have a vested interest in knowing the financial condition of your business. You know, one very popular one is lenders. You know, um, when you fill out a bank loan application, I promise you, they are want they will want to see, in addition to your tax return, your financial statements. They want to see your financial statements for the the past, and also they want to see projected financial statements as well, right? Investors, before they invest their money into your business, um, they want to see your financial statements. Stockholders, the government, namely the IRS, and suppliers. You know, suppliers may have an interest before they extend credit to you. They want to be sure that you can pay the money back. All right. So lenders are going to determine if whether or not they want to loan you money, how much, and at what interest rate, and for what collateral that you may have. Where is that collateral going to be shown at? On your balance sheet in the asset section, right? So that's where we're going to list all of our assets that could be potentially used as collateral in a loan. And then they're also going to look at the earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization to be sure that the business earns enough income to cover interest payments. Okay. And what, they, what we call is EBITDA. That's what EBITDA stands for. And then they're going to review any existing debt that you have on the balance sheet to make sure that you're not over leveraged. See, another reason why it's good to have a balance sheet is you, you'll, you'll have, if you had existing debt, you would be reporting it on that balance sheet, the money that you owe to other people. Okay. Most often business owners will have to personally guarantee the loan to the business. Okay. This is something to keep in mind for as a small business owner. Investors. Venture capitalists will want to review your financial statements before you before they write a check. I mean, that's just the like I mentioned, it is the, the accounting is the language of business and people are going to expect you to have these financial statements. Um, and so it's good to know that in advance and to start where you are right now, if you're year three, year four, year 20. Start right now where you are in tracking your finances, because if someone hasn't asked you already, they will for these. OK, and people are going to be basing their decisions to do business with you on these financial statements. Um, investors, they expect a high return on their investment, not just the repayment of principal and interest. Right. Government agencies. All right. The IRS tax forms, they require information from your P&L. For individual returns, corporate returns, and, you know, corporate returns, you're going to need to do a balance sheet as well for 1120Ss and 1120s. Most state governments require company tax returns to be filed as well, you know, so you're going to need, at the very minimum, a P&L for the state, okay? And if you're publicly owned, the financial statements are required on a quarterly and annual basis to the SEC, okay? So here's just a graphical <laughs> slide of all the different people that can potentially, and since we're in Texas, I included the Texas Comptroller of Public Accounts, um, IRS front and center, you know, banks, investors, suppliers, creditors, business partners. That's something that I didn't mention before. You know, if you're thinking on bringing on a partner in your business that maybe didn't start with you from day one, don't be surprised if they want to see the financials. You know, they may want to, you know, kind of do some due diligence about who they're getting in business with. So that is not unusual at all. Okay. All right. So in summary, proper financial management is critical. It's critical. I, I don't know if I can stress it enough. It really, really is critical to the success of your business. Um, knowing your numbers, you got to. Someone needs to, if not you, someone in your organization has to know what's going on in terms of the financial condition of your business. Um, measuring performance and financial results can help you identify key areas that need improvement. And it could be that you're doing great. If you're doing great, how wonderful it is to see that solidified, 
you know what I'm saying? That you're hitting all the targets, you're meeting all of your um, goals. I mean, that's great. You may want to give bonuses to yourself, to your employees, but you won't know that unless you're measuring your financial results. So it doesn't indicate the process doesn't always have to be a problem. You also want to reward good actions, good behaviors, you know, and reinforce those. Okay. External users will review your financial statements and make judgments on your business. Yeah, that's what happens. When I used to be in the audit, that's the first thing I asked for, your financial statements. I'm looking at your, you know, um, SEC filings, your financial statements, um, because that is the basis, should be, the basis for which you reported items on your tax return. If there are any differences, I'm going to zone in on, on those differences, okay? And you have to be able to explain it. Somebody has to be able to explain what those differences are, okay? And when you know the financial health of your business, you make better decisions. I always use an example. It's like getting in a car and putting a blindfold on and trying to drive to your destination. You know, it's just, it's you're not going to get there, you know, and you may ruin your car, ruin other people's car. You don't want to do that. You don't want to crash into anything. I mean, you just take the blindfold off so you know where you're going, you know where you're headed. You know, you can use Google Maps or GPS. You know, that's fine. But you don't want to operate a business with blindfolds, with a blindfold on. And that's what I equate it to, okay? And then don't be afraid or ashamed to ask for help if you need it, you know? Um, like I mentioned, I'm not trying to turn people into accountants. Lord knows we need more of them though. But if you don't want to be an accountant, you don't have to be. If you zone in on those key performance indicators that we talked about, you know, and do your basic bookkeeping, that's all you need. That's all you need, really. Okay. Now, as you get further in business, and you know you get to hiring people staff and you want loans then you may need additional support um to produce those numbers and a dashboard and projections and all of that but for this presentation i kept it really simple with just the three key main financial reports that everyone has to have okay so don't be afraid to reach out to the advisors the sbdc um, in other places so that you can you know, get the help that you need. All right. And I want to thank you for your attention and attendance today. Thank you so much, Angela. Uh, I very much appreciate it. As we're moving into the Q&A, it looks like with a big question mark, nicely done. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. And for those of you okay. who have other questions, please put them in the chat. And we'll be happy to respond, or you can unmute yourself and we'll be happy to take those as well. I'll start with the first one in there, which is, are there any rules or guidelines about how often partners should review financials? Um, people that are already in a business, I would say at least once a month. And, you know, when I work with clients, I make sure that they have access to their software so that they can get in there as often as they like. You know, that they can get in there and see um, if it's weekly, bi-weekly. We try to keep everything up to date so that they'll see where they are if they run a P&L statement. Um, but I would say nothing less than once a month, you know, when the month is over so you can kind of see what happened in the previous 30 days to kind of make decisions or however you want to plan the next few months. So I would say at least once a month. Great, thank you. Um, anybody else have any questions? I, I do, hi Angela, it's Roger. Just hi. Um, a, a quick question, just maybe give an average, I know it's all over the place with different industries, but is there an average net profit on a percentage basis that maybe businesses can look forward to? You know, that's, it's hard to say because it does depend on the industry. Now, I would say for service-based businesses, um, you know, that's not carrying inventory and things like that. I like to say at least 50%, you know, um, but 
it just really, really depends on so many factors, the industry, the business. Um, and then if you had like an off month where you had like a huge expense, but it's not going to be a recurring expense that you may want to extrapolate that out, you know, if it's not going to be re, re, you know, happening again, um, cause that does come up from time to time. Um, but it just really, really depends. I would get those benchmarking numbers from, and I'm sure that SBDC can provide, you know, industry uh, KPI. So you'll have something to target, but it really does depend on, you know, the business and the industry, to be quite honest with you. Thank you, Angela. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and in answer to another question, I think I can answer this question. Uh, is there access to the recording of this video? Uh, yes, there is. In fact, if you will scroll directly up to the top there, it says NCT SBDC YouTube channel. It will be posted there directly following uh, once it's been edited down. Make sure that everything is uh, okay. And we'll be happy to have that one and many of the other ones from Angela as well there. Um, one more question. At what point should owners become concerned if profits are fluctuating or is there a normal fluctuation? Does that make sense at all? <laughs> uh, yes, it does. Um, I'd be concerned anytime that you have a net loss. Um, cause usually there's a reason for it. Um, if it's, it, it could be excessive spending. You want to find out, was it something that we have committed the business to on a recurring basis or was it something one off and you're not going to see it again? Um, did you lose a customer, a few customers? You know, is the market declining for what you're selling? So anytime that there's a loss, I raise the antenna because I want to figure out what drove that loss, because if it's something that we have to, you know, prepare for, we can start to measure, okay, is the loss getting better or we, can we turn this thing around? So I wouldn't ignore it. I wouldn't ignore it. It's the first time you see a loss, you know, if it's something that you anticipated because, you know, beforehand you knew we lost a major customer or we had this one-time expense that we're not gonna have going forward then fine, but if it's totally unexpected, you don't know where it came from, I would definitely do some investigation so that you can prevent it, you know, from happening. So in other words, don't ignore it. I wouldn't ignore one month, one month's loss without knowing what's wrong with that. Pay attention. Did I get it right? <laughs> if it dips down, pay attention. Right. Right. People in the office and say, okay, what, 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 what did we change? Uh, no, that's, that's right. great advice because as a business owner, I think everybody needs to be aware of all of these numbers. And you made that really clear today uh, that it's, you are your business and you don't pay attention to your accounting. Well, you're not going to be in business long, I guess. That's so, true. That's but, true. It really is because, um, you know, you don't want like six months to go by and you're just realizing, oh my God, I, five out of those six months I had a net loss. Right. You know. And even in your first year, you may experience that if you're planning for that net loss, but you better see the curve start coming up, right? Right. You want to see improvement in that area because even the IRS expects new businesses to have losses in the first couple of years because you're spending way more, you're getting the business set up, you're, um, you know, investing in the business, you're getting some things before maybe you even have customers. So that's perfectly fine. So we know that new businesses will have losses. Um, but at some point, at some point, maybe year two, year three, you have to really figure out now, you know, we don't have the startup costs anymore. We're not, you know, getting the business together and incorporating whatever the case may be. Um, so what now is driving the loss? You know, it could be that maybe your pricing model was off. Maybe you need to get more customers. Maybe you need to reduce the expenses. So as long as you know what's happening, you can have a plan for how to turn it around, you know? Mm -hmm. Fantastic information. Thank you. Thank you again very much. Uh, we have lots of thank yous in the chat. Just saying thank you for all the informative and okay. helpful information. I'll let you go ahead and sum up and I will tell them what's coming up soon.
Okay, so this is just how you can get connected with me. I have my email here and social media. I try to, you know, post some good tips to business owners um, out there. So just, you know, if you want to stay connected and follow me, you can do that here. And again, thank you to North Central Texas for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. And, and thanks to you, Angela. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Angela Randolph. We're so happy to have you. And every time you're here, thanks for making it break down and easy for us. Uh, some of the things coming up you should know about uh, in February here. Ashley Cook is coming with How to Write a Top-Notch Website, Part 1. Part 2 will be on the 24th as well. And Texas Workforce Commission Decoded with C.J. Pettit. Um, coming up also, HR Solutions Recruit and Retain from CJ. Uh, the, and rounding out for February the 28th, right here at the end of the month, we couldn't think of anybody better than to invite Angela back. So she'll be here for Audit Proof Your Business. And we're looking forward to all of those. And for more information about it, please go to our QR. Uh, it's up in the top right corner, our QR code, and it will send you straight to the future events. And if you look in the chat, I've already placed the link again to your YouTube channel past events. So we want you to know there's been plenty of training going on and you can go on demand and get that as you are available. So with all of that said, we do want to thank a few people. Uh, first of all, we want to thank you for attending and we want to let you know there's a survey coming up right after this. So please let us know what we're doing well for you on your training or let us know what kind of training we might be missing out on that you'd like to see. We'll be happy to try to get that for you. So uh, again, um, the SBDC website has lots of information as well. If you'd like to schedule time with a business advisor, we'd be happy to do so there, as well as utilize a lot of resources you may not have known are available to you as a business owner. And all of that is at no cost to you. And how is that at no cost? Well, because we're funded. We'd like to thank the Small Business Administration. We'd like to thank the state of Texas, North Texas SBDC Regional Office, as well as the North Central Texas College for making all of this possible. And again, thank you, Angela. Thank you for attending, everybody. We look forward to seeing you next time. This will conclude our webinar for today. Have an amazing week.